Okay, so on Friday, as I'm sure most of you know, Blackmagic had an over two and a half hour live stream to kick off MEB, where Grant Petty walked us through all of their new announcements. So now we're back at our desks on Monday, we thought it would be useful to just quickly run through all 28 announcements which Grant made for people who just want to catch up on the news quickly. First up, we're going to start with the big headlines, which Grant saved for the end of the stream, but we're going to talk about straight away. Firstly, they announced Camera Update 9.5, which gives the Cinema Camera 6K a new beta firmware for their new continuous autofocus system. This is huge news. Autofocus has long been one of the most requested features from Blackmagic. They've said this is going to be rolling out to more cameras when it's ready, but right now it is just for the Cinema Camera 6K in this beta firmware, but it is available to download and try right now. Then the headline product update has to be the Pixis 12K. Blackmagic have managed to do what we all said would be impossible, maybe unlikely, and put the fantastic large format 12K RGBW sensor from the Ursa Cine 12K LF into the significantly smaller Pixis body. This makes that sensor significantly more convenient to use when compared to the much larger Ursa Cine. Now it's not going to be as capable of course, but it is much more powerful than we were expecting that kind of a camera to be. It has the same amazing dynamic range, same in-sensor raw scaling, and 12K up to 60 frames a second, or 8K or 4K up to 112 frames a second, which is much higher frame rates than we were expecting to see. That's really exciting. We're going to go into more detail once we get our hands on one, of course, but it is available to pre-order at Pro-V right now, and Blackmagic is saying it's going to be shipping around July. Now, let's go through everything else which Grant spoke about in order, and oh, there was a lot. First up, we had the Blackmagic Cloud Backup 8, which is an 8-bay hard drive reader which connects to a 10G network and lets you use those 8 hard drives to back your footage up onto. Then we have a series of three Video Hub Minis, which are a new style of SDI router designed for smaller use cases. Previously, the smallest Video Hub Blackmagic did was a 10x10. Now we have a 4x2, 6x2, and 8x4, all 12G. These are very smart. They basically act as the central point for an SDI multi-camera production, lets you take any SDI source and route it to any SDI destination which you need nice and easily. Now normally, these are for big studios. They're huge rack-mounted ones, like they're massive 80x80 or 120x120 ones. They're huge. But Having smaller ones will be very useful too in some specific situations inside bigger studios or of course for smaller studios. Next, we have some broadcast standards converters. We have the 2110 IP up, down, cross 12G. This lives in their 2110 family of products, but it's not just for 2110. It's just as important for normal SDI or HDMI workflows too. It lets you convert between different formats and it now supports 4K. So you can choose a format like 4K60, for example, and everything coming into it is just going to be converted to a 4K60 signal before then going on to the rest of your production. Similar but very different is the new 2110 IP SDI to HDMI 12G and 12G10. Now these are rack mounted, either a third or a full rack, which is the difference between the 12G and the 12G10 versions. The 12G10 has a bunch more XLR audio outputs for surround sound monitoring. Now these are specifically designed for adding HDMI monitors like TVs into SDI workflows, whether that's a monitor in a bigger studio or maybe a grading suite, something like that. We also got a new capture card, the Decklink IP100G, which is a PCIe Gen 4 card with eight lines and has two 100G network ports on it. So this is really useful for 2110 workflows and we'll be able to run up to eight channels of capture or playback in 4K. Now we have one of the largest ATEM mixers that Blackmagic have ever made, the ATEM 4ME Constellation 4K Plus, which has an incredible 80 inputs and 40 outputs. So that's over 120 SDI ports on the back of this mixer. 
the ATEM 4ME Constellation 4K and the Constellation 8K were 40 by 40 mixers. So this will be very useful for those situations where you want the freedom to have more than 40 sources. Now that sounds like a crazy high amount, but in big complex live productions, it does happen. It has a four rack unit design and very similar feature set to the regular 4ME 4K version. Grant then talked us through the new software update for Constellation Mixers, ATEM 10.0. This adds shadow buff support so that you can link the different MEs together, means they're going to follow each other when you cut. Very useful, especially for when you have a mixture of live elements like big screens, perhaps at an event, and you're broadcasting at the same time. When you've got multiple things going on like that, it's very useful. And Tally is now going to be able to be seen across those MEs, so the camera operators aren't going to be caught out thinking they weren't online when they were. We then got a look at the new Hyperdex Shuttle 4K Pro, which I can see being really popular. It's a 4K Hyperdex recorder and playback device, which can be connected to the network, but it also has the physical controls from the Hyperdex Shuttle HD and a large seven inch touch screen on it, which works as both a control panel and a confidence monitor so that you can see what's happening on the device. I can see this being one of the nicest Hyperdex models to use by far. It also has a slot on the bottom for NVMe SSD storage, so that you can either install that yourself or buy it pre-installed as the two terabyte version of the product. So with that internal storage, this can be a really powerful media engine for your ATEM live production. There's also a new software for the Hyperdeck Extreme and Video Assist products, which adds media syncing up to Blackmagic Cloud and an update to the visual on-screen displays. We also got a new ATEM micro camera control panel, which brings the same approach to their camera control panels as they did to the micro ATEM panel. It's a trimmed down version of their larger four camera panel with the same design, but one set of controls and a very nice row of buttons to select which camera you're controlling. And one really nice touch is that they light up with tally so that you know if the camera you're controlling is on air. Then we got to possibly the most important ATEM product discussed, which is the ATEM Mini Extreme G2. Now this is the first time we've seen a generation two update of any product in the ATEM Mini lineup. And this uses a very different design style to the previous ATEM Mini Extreme. We now get nice tactile raised push buttons like on the HD8 and the ATEM micro control panel. We also get a T bar and a huge improvement in audio functionality across the board, from the physical dials to new audio status screens and even full-size XLRs on the back and MADI for expanding it even further. We also now get three HDMI outputs instead of two, which is nice to see, and a CF Express card slot for recording, which is a great idea. This looks like a very smart upgrade, and I'm really looking forward to seeing if they take this same approach to the rest of the ATEM Mini lineup. Then Grant turned his attention to the web presenter and streaming bridge, both of which were sitting in a bit of a strange place in the lineup now and in need of an update. To fix this, they've turned them into the streaming encoder 4K and streaming and decoder 4K, much better names which really simplify matters. The encoder gets your work up onto the internet and the decoder receives footage from the internet. It's as simple as that now. But what really makes these exciting though is that Blackmagic Cloud can now act as a simple router, pointing different live streaming sources to different destinations and different decoders. These can be your own sources or ones invited from other people. Now, there's a lot we don't know about this yet. The biggest one for me is latency, but it does seem like it will make the whole process of adding remote sources into your live stream much simpler without needing to mess about with your network, opening ports, all of that. Taking this another step though, is the new ATEM Cloud Constellation HD4. Now, this is very much in beta at the moment, but essentially it's a full ATEM production mixer in the cloud, which you can rent and bring your whole production up into the cloud. So rather than having a few remote sources all going up into the cloud system and then back down to a decoder, being mixed in your physical studio and then being sent back up 
for final delivery for the live stream. With this, every camera is a remote source, and once they're up online, you can mix them, add effects, stream to destination, all from the web browser on the cloud. There are some remote production examples where this is obviously going to be incredibly useful, but it could actually be really useful for simpler streams, like interviewing remote guests, as both speakers would be on roughly an equal amount of latency. So we're very excited for this. We're very excited to know more, very excited to test it. But unfortunately, Grant made it very clear that this is just very much still in the testing phase. They aren't really sure when this is going to be available for end users yet, but really looks quite exciting. Then he moved on to talk about DaVinci Resolve 20, which is a massive, massive update with over 100 new features. I'm obviously not going to mention everything. There are some fantastic videos already online, like ones from our good friends over at Team 2 Films. So I'll link to those down below. But a few key features that caught my eye were Music Remixer, so that you can vary the length of your music, a much needed keyframe editor panel in the edit page, which will make everyone's lives much easier for any kind of keyframing work. There's new voice replacement tools, animated subtitles, even AI audio mixing and video editing in multi-camera. So for a simple multi-camera or podcast edit, for example, you can create that multi-camera project and AI is just going to speed through the timeline, cutting between speakers for you, and then even do an audio mix for you as well. On the color page, there's significant changes to the depth map and magic mask tools. They look great as well. There is some incredibly powerful stuff here. We also saw Grant do his first little hint that they might start charging for resolve upgrades in the future. It's a shame, but I guess it was inevitable. You know, the amount of value which they're giving to everyone for free who has Resolve Studio has been pretty incredible. Considering the price of Resolve in the first place and that they give it away for free with a lot of their products, they could very easily charge a fee to upgrade for each release and still end up being so much more affordable than Adobe subscriptions are, for example. He also showed how Blackmagic Cloud can now just simply store folders of footage and files rather than having to be linked to a specific project online, which is a really nice quality of life upgrade. Then we got onto cameras, which is when Grant showed off those new autofocus updates. But that wasn't all we got. We also got a look at camera 9.6, which is going to add pre-roll or pre-record recording to the Pixis and Ursa Broadcast G2. Now this can be set to always on or to activate when you hold the record button. And then it will save the previous 10 seconds of footage when it starts recording. It wasn't clear though if this is going to work in slow motion mode or not though, but it should be available in a few weeks to download, so I guess we'll find out then. Then there was one more camera update, camera 9.7, which is a nice simple one. It just simply adds support for the Pixis monitor to the Micro Studio Camera 4K G2. Nice and simple, but it's going to make a massive difference to users of that camera. Then we turned to the cinema cameras. Just like the Ursa Cine 12K LF, the 17K version is now going to be available in a body-only configuration. The 17K body-only will be a slightly different spec though. It will have a PL mount instead of an EF one, come with an 8TB media module instead of the CF Express module because of the extra resolution on that camera. Then it was time for the star of the show, the new Pixis 12K. We've already discussed this, but it is such an important camera. It's already proving really popular with customers. It wasn't the only update for Pixis though. We also got the Pixis Pro handle and Pro grip, which when used together, they kind of turned the Pixis into an ENG camcorder with a built-in mic on the top, EVF on the back and servo rockers. This was quite unexpected. I mean, it's not a bad idea by any means. The more ways you can use your camera, the better. But the missing piece of the puzzle is definitely going to be the lenses. There just aren't that many servo lenses which would be suitable for that kind of use. Then to finish, they showed the new Cintel Scanner G3 HDR Plus 8x16, which is designed to scan 8mm film. Phew. So, <laughs> that was 28 new announcements from Blackmagic in one of their most packed release streams yet. 
So head over to proev.co.uk with the link down below to see all the prices and the estimated arrival times for each of those products. And of course, to buy any of them which you want for your own work. And let us know what your thoughts are in the comment section. Which of those 28 announcements has caught your eye the most? And what would you like to see us take a look at on the channel and test out? Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.